right, we are where we are at. Let's roll. Let's press primer. Yeah. Lesson three. There we go. This one's going to be on inheritance. So this is very exciting, because now we're moving on to the next world of object-oriented. Now, before we begin class or start doing anything, we want some questions. Questions on your assignments. Does anybody have any that they decided not to send me something about, but they'd like to talk about now, so we can go over it for the benefit of the entire class. If you're going to talk about a question, please do bring up the assignment you were working on, A, B, or G. Kevin. is. But luckily, the content of that question is going to be answered by class. So hold off for now, and we'll get back to that later. All right? Anything else? All right. Oh, is that a question? No, I just realized. It's safe. Ooh, zero points. No, I didn't see JK. OK, so next questions. When is class over? got this question more than a couple times for more than a different couple people. They've wanted to know. And to be honest, I'd like to know too. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about when it's over. There isn't a concrete date, but there are a set of things that I want to go over so that everyone has a basic understanding of C++. Those are C++ basic syntax, object-oriented basics, inheritance, virtual constructors, standard temple library, iterators, pointer types, unique versus shared, copy constructors and copy control, and overloaded operators. Of those, we've been here about three weeks, and we've gone over basic syntax, object-oriented basics, and we're going to be going over inheritance and virtual constructors. So we can say we've probably covered about a topic and a half per week, which means uh, we'll probably have maybe <coughs> six, seven weeks left, give or take, depending on how quickly or slowly everyone moves. All right? Is that a satisfactory explanation? OK. No mutiny, so we're good. Grading system. Gone. It was kind of uh, um, convoluted, and I don't know if I have the authority to give grades off of assignments that may be too difficult or too easy. So I'll be keeping record of the assignments you've done, and if you want a grade at the end, I'll give you a grade, but you're not getting a grade from me otherwise. All right? Does anybody have any problems with that? Does anybody really want a grade? Cool. Gone. So let's go straight to class. Story time. We're going to begin with the story. So I love stories. This was actually given to me by the uh, lead lead test engineer at iRobot, or Dev Robotics now. It was how he learned object oriented, and I figured it would be a pretty good time to pass it on. So this is an old story. It was written in maybe 97, 95, uh, so it may be a little bit dated. Eh. We'll get to that. Anyway, once upon a time in a kingdom, not far from here, a king summoned two of his advisors for a test. He showed them both a shiny metal box with two slots in the top, a control knob, and a lever. What do you think this is? One advisor, an electrical engineer, answered first. It is a toaster, he said. King asked, how would you design an embedded computer for it? The advisor, using, the advisor, using a 4-bit microcontroller, I would write a simple program that reads a darkness knob, quantifies its position to one of 16 shades of darkness from snow white to coal black program would use that darkness level as the value to a 16 element table of initial timer values and then it would turn on the heating elements and start the timer with the initial value selected from the table. At the end of the time delay it would turn off the heat and pop up the toast. Come back next week and I'll show you a working prototype. The second advisor, a software developer, immediately recognized the danger of such short-sighted thinking. He said, toasters don't just turn bread into toast, they are also used to warm frozen waffles. <laughs> Sorry, I still laugh. I also used warm frozen waffles. What you see before you is really a breakfast food cooker. As the subjects of your kingdom become more sophisticated, they will demand more capabilities. They will need a breakfast food cooker that can also cook sausage, fry bacon, and make scrambled eggs. A toaster that only makes toast will soon become obsolete. If we don't look, for, look, to, look to the future, we will have to completely redesign the toaster in just a few years. With this in mind, we can formulate a more intelligent solution to the problem. First, create a class of breakfast foods. Specialize this class into subclasses, grains, pork, and poultry. 
The specialization process should be repeated with grains divided into toast, muffins, pancakes, and waffles. Pork and bacon, and poultry divided into scrambled eggs, and, and poultry divided into scrambled eggs, hard-boiled eggs, poached eggs, fried eggs, and various omelet classes. The ham and cheese omelet class is worth special attention because it must inherit characteristics from pork classes. Thus, we see the problem that cannot properly be solved without multiple inheritance. At runtime, the program must create the proper object and send a message to the object that says, cook yourself. The semantics of the message depend, of course, on the kind of object, so they have a different meaning to, to a piece of toast than to scrambled eggs. Reviewing the process so far, we see that the analysis phase is revealed that the primary requirement is to cook any kind of breakfast food. In this design phase, we have discovered some derived requirements. Specifically, we must need an object with multiple inheritance. Of course, users don't want the eggs to get cold while the bacon is frying, so concurrent processing is required too. We must not forget the user interface. The lever that lowers the food lacks versatility. The darkness knob is confusing. Users won't buy the product unless it has a user-friendly graphical interface. When the breakfast cooker is plugged in, the user should see a cowboy boot on the screen. <laughs> Sorry. Users click on it and see the booting message. Booting Unix v.8.3 appears in the screen. Unix should not be out by the time the product gets to market. Oh, it's a side note by the author. Users can pull down a menu and click on the foods they want to cook. Having the wise decision of specifying the software in the first design phase, all that remains is to pick an adequate platform for the implementation phase. An Intel Pentium with 48 megabytes of memory. A 1.2 gigabyte hard disk and an SVGA monitor should be specific. If you select a multitasking object-oriented language that supports multiple inheritance and is built in GUI, writing the program should be a snap. The king wisely had the software developer beheaded and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea behind inheritance. And that's the idea behind what this is going to talk about. One thing being many things, also known as... Oh, oh that was it. Polymorphism. There we go. And this is a big takeaway from object-oriented. The idea of reuse. The software developer may have had his head cut off, but he was pretty dang right with what he talked about. Make something that's easily reusable by a lot of different things, something general enough, but also specific enough to accomplish a certain task with something that's very important with object-oriented. This one thing can be many things. This is a big takeaway for polymorphism, and make sure you remember that. Now, this goes into actual C++ when we talk about overloading and overriding functions. Uh, we already did some overloading functions but we have not done overriding. We're going to go over that today when we get into actual inheritance tutorials. All right, this also goes into implicit conversions. So, if I do, oh, by the way, send that to me in Slack if you have it. Let me write it in black. There you go. So, where was I? Talking about, oh yes, yeah, implicit conversions. So for those in computer science, you know that, well, let me, let me ask. Is five plus 3.5 valid? Can we do that? Will the compiler complain? Is the right answer to this? Is that, is that no to the compiler will complain, or is it valid? Cool, you're right. Because even though this, is, this could be a float or a double, and this is an integer, it doesn't care. So if we set int num equal to this, that's fine. We'll just give eight. And if we do double num equal to that, then it's going to give us 8.5. This means that this statement can have two different meanings, even though it's only one statement. For those who aren't in computer science and don't know the difference, an integer is a number in computer science with no decimal in place which means when we write 8.5, which is the initial number we get, we slice it off when we put it into number. And a double is just a number with decimal places. Many decimal places, it's very big. So the significance of this is that one statement can mean many things. And even in a basic language like C, you can find implicit conversions, in which cases you technically have cases of polymorphism in non-object-oriented languages, which is really cool to think about, because you weren't working with object-oriented when you were computing one or two. All right, so let's move right along. Syntax. What is a specific syntax for inheritance? This is important, and syntax can get a little bit annoying once you move along. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I've been working with Python all day and Java, so I may make a mistake when I'm actually doing a tutorial, but please bear with me if I do. Syntax for this, 
First we have a base class. We make a base class, whatever it's going to be called. We'll go into a specific one later on. This just looks like a regular class. Nice. And then we have a derived class. And you know what the difference here between this one and this one is that we have this cool little colon and we also have this modifier, access modifier, public and base class right after it. What this does is that it means derived class inherits from base class. And we'll get into, like I said, we'll get into a specific example in, will I do it now? Yes, we'll get into a specific example in just a moment. So, what this means is that derived class is also a base class, but it's also a derived class. Just like how you can be an employee at a supermarket, your manager can also be an employee at a supermarket, but he or she happens to be a level above. So in this case, it would be manager is also an employee. What is the significance of this? A manager can be an employee, but an employee cannot be a manager unless they're promoted. But that's not going to happen to C++. So you can, if you're stuck in the employee position, you're stuck forever. Sorry, guys. Uh, so that's the idea behind inheritance, OK? So, any questions so far? Yes? Is public strictly just public for the base class or can it be access to the private portion of the base class? The access modifier here must be, pu must be public. You can't make this private or, stat or anything else. If you're talking about what goes here, you can't change that. No, I meant like the derived class. Here. This right here. It has to say public right there. Otherwise, the compiler will throw an error. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, try it. Which is the manager and which is the employee in the second in one? This, in this example, derived class would be the manager because it's sort of a level above, and base class would be the employee. Because the manager is both an employee and a manager, which means derived class is both a derived class and a base class, and we can tell by this colon but the employee is not a manager, and thus the base class is not a derived class either. Does that make sense? Any other questions so far? Yes? Can this also overlap with multiple derived class and derived class after the analogous recipe? Do you mean could I do like C, you might not be able to see this, CEO above? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. It's very common. You'll have lots of that. Um, maybe, actually, if you did the gamma assignment or you looked at the gamma assignment, that was actually part of that assignment where you had to do, well, you'll see, um, where you had to do that. Any other questions so far? Okay, moving right along. So what use are these, uh, these different classes if we can't do things with them that are, you know, let's show that they are derived. And the answer to that is with virtual functions, okay? So, what a virtual function is, is that when we have a function, actually, I'm going to erase this, but I'm actually not going to use it. Yeah. We have a function, and actually, I'm going to use it. We have a function, and maybe we go back to the food example that I used, or that the object or the toaster one used. So, we have a class. And this one's going to be called food. In this one, we're going to ignore everything else except for this one function called cook food. Okay? This is the header file all the way. The thing with cook food is that you can't cook food if all you have is food. Because what is food? You mean a lot of different things. So this is going to have absolutely no meaning. It is a function prototype. So we have the word virtual before it. And we also have return type because it's not a constructor. Virtual. It's going to be easier to read when we actually get to a, an example. And then from there, we have to set this equal to zero. Right? I'll just rewrite this so it's a little bit more legible for now. So virtual void book equals zero in my parentheses. Okay? 
this is a virtual function. On its own, this is absolutely nothing. And in fact, if we try to make a food, if I make a food, let's pretend it has a default constructor. Food, food. This makes an instance of food, but the compiler is going to get angry because now we're trying to instantiate something that has a virtual method in it. Because of that, it's going to do absolutely nothing. And actually, no, it, it, it has no functionality, but it will throw an error. I'm very sorry. So, in order to work with this, we need to make a separate class that is based off of food, inherits from food, and then from there, we'll go about implementing this method. So, like I said, virtual functions, they don't do anything on their own. They are used specifically as function prototypes, or more or less like, I guess, abstractions that you can work with. They must be implemented by derived classes to instantiate those. Any class with a virtual function immediately loses its ability to be instantiated. It's become a pure virtual function, okay? And virtual function, oh, there we go, let's stop here for, yep. Back there we go. It must be instantiated, must be implemented by a derived class in order to make an instance of it. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay. And let's move right along. Virtual function syntax. I already wrote it on the board, but let's write it down. In the base class, this is what it looks like. More legible. We have virtual void and this is cooked food, we set it equal to zero. Then, in the derived class, we have the implementation. We're also going to have, and we'll show you in a moment, in the header file, you also have to have cooked food in there as well. And I didn't, I didn't um, put the class colon colon there, but you would have derived colon colon cook food. Okay? Now, Let's get out of the abstract. Let's actually do an example. So I'm going to go to my terminal. And I'm going to go to my directory. Three. And we are going to build some inheritance stuff right here, right now. So here we have a template repository. Basic and boring as always. But it's only boring because we haven't done anything with it yet. So. I'm going to open up another terminal real quick. I have two right here. And I'm going to go to the include folder. And I'm going to make a header file for food. So, and let's make this bigger. Hey, someday I'm going to remember to make these just bigger by default. Today is not that day. Touch. Touch is the Linux command for creating a file. Food.h. And then, eh. and then I'm going to go to source, and I'm going to make a food.cpp. All right, let's open these and start working on them. I'm going to do the header file first. And I'm going to glaze through some parts of this, because a lot of it is very similar to what we did last week. There are some parts that I don't want to, though, and we'll, we'll make sure that there is enough time for those. And of course, if anyone wants me to slow down, please just say so, and I will slow down. So we're going to make a class. Eh, there's my autocomplete. And it's going to be food. And now we have our class. And I just want to, before I continue working on it, I want to talk about this little thing right here with the squiggly line. This is called a destructor. So when we're talking about C++, and this is going to be a little bit complicated for a moment for those who aren't computer scientists or in computer science courses, I'm sorry. Um, when you allocate memory, there are two places it can be allocated, the stack and the heap. When you allocate in the stack, you don't really need to worry about that memory too much. It's automatically dealt with because it's, it's dealt with at compile time, which is when you run make. But and then when you build it, I'm sorry. But when you put things on the heap, this is memory that you make while the program is running. There is an indeterminate amount of memory that can be used here. So because of that, sometimes you need a manual way of destroying things in your class. And this is what a structure does. Don't get too worried about this yet. 
it's not going to bother you at all right now. But in order to have a virtual class, sorry, in order to have inheritance in a class, you need to have a destructor. We're going to talk about what they are more in following classes. Okay. So we have food, and we it's constructor, and we have its destructor right here. Okay. Let's add some things on. So I'm going to make private. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a member variable, pool is cooked. Okay. And then from here, I want to make a function. I think I should have a way of getting whether or not it's cooked. So pool, this is the return type. And I'm also, also, I'm sorry, boolean or bool is a value in computing that means true or false. That's it. One or, or in this case, zero or one. Zero being false, one being true. So we're going to make it return a bool, and we're going to say get cooks status, or rather, is food cooks. We're not actually going to have a question mark there. <laughs> and then finally, we need a way to cook the food. But remember, this is just food. How do you cook food? You don't, because you don't know what the heck food is. So this has a virtual, and then from there, we're going to make food, and we need a return type too. What am I missing? Zero. Yes, raise your hand next time. Zero points if you don't. All right, so now we have our food.h. Let's go back, and let's go about making implementation for our header for our C++ file, okay? So in this we need to include our foo.h because how else does it know it's a food file? It doesn't. And then from there, we need to make a constructor. So this is going to be like a standard constructor. Food we do these the two colons to prefix. Food. Now note because it's a constructor, it has the same name as the class. It is not a constructor if it does not have the same name as the class, even if you don't have a return type. And now we need to have this, uh, this food do things. What this is going to do is it go it's going to set is cooked to false. Because if you have food and it's not cooked, it's obviously not cooked. I'm just going to split this here and here. Okay. And we're going to set is cooked equals false. All right. Now we have to implement the destruct. Oh, yes. Question. Do I need to include IR string? Are you printing right now? No. Exactly. Don't include what you don't need. So in addition to that, you can make a lot of, you can make methods virtual. And you can make methods that are implemented virtual as well. So if I were to do this, now, because it isn't set to zero, it's still OK. And we can still override it in classes that derive from this. But because we have virtual there, that's a performance hit. So only put virtual in front of things that you need, and only include IO stream if you need to. Yes? So why are you assigning it zero? Because it is a pure virtual method. We don't know how to cook food. Because how do you cook food? You know how to cook eggs. Maybe you know how to cook pancakes. Maybe you can make a great batch of oatmeal. But food? I don't have any just, I don't have like generic food boxes laying around. It needs to be a thing. Food is just a prototype. It's a way of saying this is food. But we don't know what to do with it. So we set it equal to zero. Because of this, it's a pure virtual function. And we can never make an instantiation of food. So it's just a way of displaying, displaying this. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? I might have missed this, but what is um, bool, uh, B -O -L, what bool. Is bool stands for Boolean. So, back in the day, when computer science was all written in assembly or punch cards or whatever you like, Everything was written, not everything was written in binary, but everything was more, was closer to like ones and zeros, okay? And you needed a way of representing whether or not you should do something. 
And you do so by saying something is true or false. Is this condition correct or is it incorrect? And how do you do that? You only have two numbers, one and zero. So, computer scientists decided one is going to equal true and zero is going to equal false. And this is the modern day bully. Now, we don't necessarily work with ones and zeros anymore, although if you do in C++, you will get a one or a zero. A Boolean stands for one of two values. It stands for true or it stands for false. Now in C++, there are a couple little tricks here and there where zero is false, but any number that isn't zero is true. So if you put it, if you ask if five, that's true. And if you do if zero, it's false. Okay? Does that make sense? Did I go too deep with that? Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna define oh wait, any more questions? We're going to define is food cooked? Now we can tell whether or not the food is cooked at this level. We can't cook it, we can tell whether or not it's cooked. So we're gonna define food and is food cooked. And then we're going to return is cooked. Is there anything confusing so far? Did anybody catch my mistake? Don't just shake your head yes. What, what, what is it? Go ahead. Exactly. So we need a return type. We need bool, so we know that we are returning a boolean. Fine. We've filled almost everything we need to here. We need to also define our destructor. But our destructor is going to do absolutely nothing at the moment. So we need to do food, tilde food, and that. So it's an empty function. We're not dy dynamically allocating anything here, so this is OK. We're going to need it anyway, which kind of hurts my heart. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so now we have all that. We have our implementation of food. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make a main, a driver class. So I'm going to call it main, so we'll main dot cpp, make it big. We're going to, in, we're going to just make main. And we'll just leave it at that for now. And we'll run this to make sure it works. And it works. So we're good to go. No compiler mistakes thus far. So let's keep on building. We only have food so far. What else could we have? Does anybody have a favorite type of food that they want cooked? This isn't a rhetorical question. Any, anybody want food specific there? Chicken wings, okay. So let's make some chicken wings. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to define that here first. So uh, and now we've made our header file for chicken wings. We need to go about making our class. So class, standard class stuff so far. What do we need to do now? How do I say that this is deriving from inheritance? Does anybody know? Nick. Do the colon and specify the access to the public and the base class. That is correct. So, why is this wrong so far? What you said was right. What's wrong so far? What else do you need to do? Bless you. No, not yet. Soon. Even before that. What is food? How do you know? Exactly. Include food.h. Now, before we continue, there is a big problem with this. Not this specifically, but eventually, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that, where'd my eraser? Here it is. 
things at for now. What we have is food, not H, and deriving from it are chicken wings. And here what we're doing is we're taking food.h and we're putting it in chicken wings, okay? But what happens if we make another food? Maybe like, I don't know, tacos. What happens now is we have food.h in two different places. Because when you say this include, what the compiler really does is it copies and pastes it into these two files. You could do this on your own, it's called forward declaration. It's just less clean and it's easier, it's a better way to learn if you do it this way. So what happens is that now we have food.h in two files. It's in two different places, this is bad. Especially if we decide to include chicken wings and include tacos inside our main class. Because now we have this taste twice. This is multiple definition and multiple declaration and the compiler is going to get angry. So what we need to do is we need to do something called create header guards. Now let me show you how to do that. Okay, we're going back to class. And what a header guard does is it makes sure a header file is not included more than once. This is basically protection against multiple definitions or declarations. So to do that, we need to do... Ah! Autocomplete. Out of here. We do a hash if and def hash define and then at the bottom we do a hash oh crap. We should do need it hash and diff. And then from here we need to uh, need to put our the name of our class and h. So we do food underscore h and we do food underscore h and it's good practice to put food underscore h here. So let me explain what's going on with this right now. These are all macros. And there are things that the compiler has already defined for us to a degree. So what happens here is if food.h is not defined, if n def define food. Otherwise, end if. That's all it is. It's just a bit it's a basic conditional. Okay? And what this is going to do is it's going to prevent things from being def def defined multiple times. Yes? This might be out of the scope of what you want to teach, but what okay. is an each file? It is a header file. That's it. So is now, it a special kind? Files, file extensions don't matter at all. I could call this file food.cheese if I wanted to. And that would be okay. The computer wouldn't care because the file extension doesn't matter at all. So, when people were working with C++, they said, we're also working with C because C++ and C are a little bit different, but we can include C in our C++. So what happened is that they wanted a way to say, what is C and what is C++? So for the header files, C files would have the .h extension, and C++ header files would have the .hpp extension. This isn't always used today. It's sort of a little of no a normal practice now. C has sort of fallen out of use a little bit. But that's, that's what it means. In fact, you'll still find it around. It's still valid to do, and you can make HPP files if you want to. Just not if you're sending them to me. OK, any other questions? All right, so we're going back to our chickenwings.h. And what we need to do now is we need to give definition to that virtual function that we just made. So let's split this up real quick so we can see it. One, two, and whoop, wrong one. And now we need to make the same function that is right here, cook food. So I'm going to do that very much right here. Void cook food. That's it. Now we have a version of chicken wings that has cook food. We haven't said what it does yet, but now we've said we're going to work with it. 
Now, something to note here is that we don't have virtual behind this. Now, could we have virtual behind this? Yes, we could. Is there a reason to? Some people say there is. And in fact, if we work with the Java, it's good practice to put at override over any functions that do the exact same thing as this. But for this, I'm saying it's not mandatory and it can be easy to forget, so don't do it for now, unless you really want to. With it. Um, so what we just did here, actually, let's actually give it implementation. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go to make a chicken wings .h. So going into our source folder and so And now I'm going to bring this up and bring this over here. And we're going to define chickenwings.cpp. First case, first thing we need to do, we need to include chickenwings.h, of course. Now we need to make a constructor. Now the thing with this constructor is that it actually doesn't need to do anything. It's following the exact same thing the food does here. We need it anyway, though. Chicken wings, colon, colon, chicken wings. And there's a constructor. But Darry, what if I actually needed to do things here? You could do things. You could do see out things, and you'd be good to go. But Darian, what if the base class doesn't have a default constructor? Now this, this is reasonable. If we go back to our food.h, you're going to note the only constructor we have here is default. Can anybody tell me what a default constructor is? Yes. Right. So if I make a hypothetical class called dog, and I have a constructor, Bless you. I have a class called dog. Oops. Dog. This right here is a default constructor. But if I'm going to make a second constructor, dog, and this one's going to take an integer, and we'll say age, now we have two constructors. This can be, we can instantiate dog without any arguments by doing this, dog, and let's give it a name, Rover. But if I didn't have this default constructor, the way we would initialize it is that we would put two parentheses right here and we'd give it an age. And if the constructor in the derived class didn't have, if we didn't have a default constructor, what we would need to do is we need to do make what's called an initialization list. Just like how we would define the class, we put a colon, and then we would say food, and then give it whatever we needed to give it. Okay? We don't need to do that though, so don't worry about it right now. Now we have our chicken wings. But we're still missing something. And what we're missing right here is the definition for cook food. So let's make that and stop talking. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do void as a return type. Now, even though we have a version in food, we're not going to say food colon colon. What we're going to do is chicken wings colon colon. And then from there we do is food cooked. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Cook food. That was my fault. Cook food. Now, we technically could, for now, do this. What happens when we decide to do it with multiple, we have multiple classes inheriting from food though, we're gonna get some errors. So we need to do chicken wings, colon, colon, food. And we're just gonna cook our food now. How we wanna cook our food. I've never really cooked chicken wings. Uh, we're gonna include Iowa stream. And we're just gonna do using and STD out and using Endle. And then I'm gonna see out. I don't know. Uh, wings. Uh, pudding wings. And fryer. And then. I 
don't know, sort of like a comfort food. Adding some love. And then, I'm just gonna say, eh, taking out a fryer. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the food is finally cooked. So, we're gonna say is cooked equal to true. And finally, we're just gonna print just so the user can see food is cooked. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this so far? It would be difficult to catch, so I'm not surprised. But we'll get back to it. And we're, oh, oh, no, okay, okay. All right, so we'll get back to that, and we'll talk about why it's wrong in a second. Now we have enough to go about making things in our main class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some chicken wings. Because why shouldn't I? So, chicken wings. And, I don't know. How many chicken wings? What kind of wings do I want? I'll say BBQ wings. All right. And what I'm going to also do, what I need to do now also is I need to include chickenwings.h. Because how else is it going to know what chicken wings are? So, include dot h. And then I'm just going to check to make sure it's cooked, which it won't be. So I also need to include iostream. And using std cout, using std handle. And I'm just going to see out and food is cooked. And then we're going to do plus, no plus, I'm sorry, that's, that's Python and Java. I'm going to do bbq wings dot, and we're going to use our is food cooked over here. Is food cooked? I'm just going to print a return character. We're going to cook the food. Q wings dot cook food. And then we're just going to do this again. Now, this is going to throw a compiler error. And then I'm going to ask again if anybody happens to know. And if you don't, I'll just give the answer. So we're going to go to builds. And we're going to go to cmake dot dot. Oh, dot. We're going to make. Now. Oh, let's make it again just so you can see. What's wrong with this? Does anybody, can anybody understand what this is saying right now? Give a hint. Uh, yeah, it's private. Yes! So, if you didn't hear, the data, the data member has to be protected. It can't be private. If we make it private, what's going to happen? No one can access it. Not even classes that derive from it. This is entirely why we need protected. So we need to change this to protected. And now, assume I didn't make any other egregious errors, it'll make. Now, it looks like I did happen to make an error. Oh, I didn't include the destructure. I'm very sorry. So what we need to do, just like how we did with food, we need to go to chickenwings.cpp, and we're going to do chicken wings, colon, colon, and we're going to have an empty destructor, just like that. And then we're going to run again, and it works. So we're going to go to bin, and we're going to run this. And here we go. So food is cooked. We get a zero back, because zero means false. And then we're going to start cooking the food. Taking it out of the fryer, food is cooked. We're going to check again. And we get one, just like everything we've ever wanted. So nice. And that, that is some basic inheritance. So are there any questions so far? No. Then we're going to make one more quick food, just so I can show 
that we can have the same method doing different things. I'm going to zing through this because we're slowly running out of time. Quickly running out of time. We're running out of time either way. So we're going to go to source. We're going to go back another directory, cd source. And I'm going to make pancakes. So subl pancakes cpp. I'm also going to have to make, oh, get back here, terminal. Pancakes.h. And I'm going to make class. Oh, I'm going to misspell it too. No, I'm better than this. All right, I'm going to make class. And I'm going to make uh, an implementation of a virtual function. So cook food. And this has to be a return type of void. All right, and this needs to inherit from food. Now we need to go about making our pancakes. So include pancakes.h. Then we need to make our constructor. Our useless destructor. And then we need to cook our food. So void pancakes. And we're just going to cook the food like we did before. So let's include all this stuff. Paste. And we're going to go to this. And obviously, it's not going to follow the same thing because it's different. But it's going to follow the same idea. So we can say getting out batter. Water and back here and cooking pancakes and they're gonna say true and we're gonna say food is cooked. Now I have some perfectly valid pancakes. I'm gonna make some pancakes now. So pancakes and say blueberry. We're just going to do the exact same thing that we did with chicken wings, but with pancakes. Sounds like it'd be an awful combination. I don't know if I'd like chicken and pancakes. I feel like IHOP is crazy for doing that. Blueberry pancakes. Blueberry pancakes. So now let's run this. So we added a new file. So we need to do cmake dot dot. We need to make. Now, let's see what I did wrong. Blueberry pancakes dot is food cooked. Let's see it bigger. So, what I did was that I forgot a semicolon. Of course. Oh, I didn't forget a semicolon. Pancakes. Oh, it wasn't declared in the scope. There we go. So, most important thing, and very easy to forget if you work in an IDE all the time like I do at work. Uh, you need to include pancakes. <laughs> like uh, a lot of build environments will do this for you, but in this case, it did not. Now, I didn't include food in pancakes either, it looks like, because I'm rushing. So moral of the story, don't rush when you're writing, when you're writing food. <laughs> and there we go, CD bin. Now, even though that was really fast, what's going to happen is that even though, uh, even though I have two different functions, two different types of, did I not? Seriously? I'm slipping. I'm slipping so much. I forgot to cook the, I forgot, I cooked the barbecue wings twice. Blueberry pancakes. There we go. So we're going to make one more time. And I'll stop making mistakes. <laughs> CD this and dot slash. So even though we have two different types 
and they're working with the same function. What's happening is that we get a different output based on the data type we're using. So we cook barbecue wings in a different way than we're cooking chicken wings. So what happens is we get different output. Does that make sense? Any questions? Did I lose anyone when I was flying? <laughs> I'm thinking the answer is yes, but that's okay. This will be up on uh, GitHub as well. Actually, this won't be on GitHub. I actually have a much more fully fledged version on GitHub called Inheritance Tutorial. So make sure if you're checking out the class resources to see there, you'll find a much better version with multiple different versions of food all over the place. And it's nice and well commented too, just for your help. Okay. So that is your basic stuff on inheritance. So let's quickly, while we still have time, talk about the STL. This is what we're going to be going over the following weeks and also what you're probably going to be working with if you do some gamma stuff. So the standard template library is a library or a set of, it's a library, it's a set of useful functions that you can use for just about anything. And it's called template because just about any data type, really any data type, can go about can go inside these things. So if you work with C, you know that you have to if you want to make a dynamic array, you have to make a dynamic array. You can't just have it there. In C++, they said screw that. Let's go about making something that does this all for you. Because if someone can make a better version of an array than you can, why wouldn't you use that? You'd be silly not to. There is this thing called a vector in C++, and this is a dynamic array and it's lightning fast. It's also used for, so it's an array that can resize on its own, and it's easy to use. It's got a basic set of functions that are equipped throughout all the types of the STL. All right. Syntax for using any of these um, is that you do std for standard, colon, colon, if we're working with a vector, we say the type, and t is the type of thing we're using, the type of class. So if we want to put a vector of pancakes, we're going to put pancakes in there instead of T. If we want to do a vector of chicken wings, we're going to put chicken wings in there instead of T. T is only there if you want something generic. It's not there if you want to use things. So this brings us back to a question that was asked earlier by Kevin. How do you go about including just foo.h or including just shape.h and yet still working with the derived classes. Now the point of virtual functions is to make it so that if you're working with a function, foo.h, actually let's use red, it has a method, hook food. But it's never actually going to use this because this is a virtual function. It's going to look for the most derived version when it's working with something, or the version that it should be using. So if we're working with tacos, we can say that tacos are food, but they're really tacos. So because this is a virtual function, it's going to go and it's going to look for the cooked food, cooked food in tacos. Why is this useful to us? We're just going to make some tacos and call it a day. Well, because maybe you have a really big pantry and you want to store your food. So you're just going to have shelves upon shelves of food. And you happen to have that magic toaster that the beheaded software engineer was working with. So what you can do is just put this food into the toaster and it works. But in order to do that, we can't just make an instantiation of food. We need to say, that because this is virtual, it needs to look in the derived versions of classes. So even though our cabinet can hold food, what these things really are is that this is tacos and this is barbecue wings. So if we have a vector of type food, vector food, or better yet, if we take a constructor, and we're going to say that this is chef. And the constructor is going to take food because the chef is skilled. You can cook any type of food. We're going to call this uh, basic food. 
if the chef happens to say basic food dot cook food even though we're now calling cook food on a base class it doesn't matter because cook food is actually a, a virtual function so we can't put food in here but we can put tacos in here and we can also give the chef uh, wings or any other type of food, maybe pancakes he's only going to see his food but he knows how to cook it so he's going to cook it and there you have your cooked food you can include only food.h if you want to. And you don't have to include tacos, and you don't have to include wings. But when you call cook food, it will call their respective versions of cook food because cook food is a virtual method. Does that make sense? Yes? Then you call it just like that, basic food. food. Yes, that's exactly how you'd call it. Okay. You don't need to cast it. If you don't know what casting is, it's okay. What we are going to do is just going to call that. It's going to work. Yes. Would you need to include them in the, um, the file that calls that? Like, would you need to include tacos in food? You would need to include tacos in your main function. But just like how we didn't include food in, sorry, just like how we didn't include chicken wings inside of food.h, we don't need to include tacos or wings inside there either. Because food doesn't care what derives it. It's just going to look for other implementations because it's a virtual function. Now, in your main function, in your main method, in your main class, you do need to include pancakes and you do need to include chicken wings because you're working directly with those. But for the base ones, you don't because it doesn't care. Yes? So you could say chef or food. Yes, you would say chef, and in the constructor you would put barbecue wings, and then it would cook. Anything else? Yes? I thought the end goal was to not have to include pancakes and wings in main. Not in main. Main doesn't care. What we do care about, though, is our implementation. Because if this, food, if this chef could only make tacos, he'd be out of a job really fast. <laughs> but if he can cook food, he can cook anything. Anything that we've defined. Yes? So, since I'm like, in this, that they have both tacos and wings would have a food function in them, how would it know which one to use if they're both derived classes? Because we're passing it in, we're passing wings into Chef, there's a unique identifier that's passed along as well. So the compiler knows what you're working with, even if you don't. You would say, and we are out of time. If you want to go, you may leave. Um, so that's technically expensive. So what we would do is we would say, we're going to make uh, some food. So we're going to say food, and we're going to make tacos. Actually, I can do this there. I don't know. And... We're going to make some tacos, and tacos, and just, that's, we're just going to call them that. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a chef. So chef, and I don't know, call him David, just because I looked at David. <laughs> and we're going to pass the tacos in, and now the chef is going to cook them. That's it. That's all there is to it. All right. Does that answer your question? And is it explanative enough? So we could do that if we only put food in the chef part? Yes. Right. Yes. What is a chef exactly in this style? In this case, the chef is a class oh. that just cooks food. That's it. Okay. Don't worry about this too much if you're only going to work on the alpha or beta assignments for now. This is just an intro. Anything else? Be free. Class, everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will be here for a couple minutes more.